We've heard the phrase fear of failure. Have you heard the phrase, though, fear of success? When we are in a season, it could be a season of growth. It could be a season of being. It could be a season of doing. Our guest today dives into the multiple seasons of growth that can take place. There's the force growth and the chosen growth. And she will talk about how, depending on what season of growth and change you are in, how you need to have that right mindset. And that mindset needs to include how are you going to overcome that fear of success. Let's join the conversation today with Rosa Castaño. Welcome to the GSD Factor Podcast. I'm your host, Misha Blaymeyer farish and today I'm excited to have Rosa Castaño. Hi, Rosa. How are you? Hello. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Share with everyone a little bit about your story. Yes. So I founded a company called Workplace Stress Solutions, and it really serves to partner with corporate companies who want to support their employees' mental health and well-being in the workplace, specifically around stress management, resiliency, personal development, and goal setting. So that includes things like movement, meditation, mindfulness. And because of all of that, I have been able to grow this speaking platform that has really allowed me to create this high-level keynote that supports the workshops for either in corporate offices, for conferences, for women's groups, retreats, all of these things, because the whole underlying message of the stress management and the mindfulness kind of goes hand in hand with how do we set goals? How do we get off our hamster wheel of life and actually realize that we can create the trajectory that we're wanting to go on, but we have to do it mindfully and intentionally. Amazing. And you have a new keynote, a new focus that you're talking about, and it's about fearless. So let's talk and dive into this topic because I think so many people think about this topic and they think about what does that mean? So would love to kind of have you take us on this journey. Yeah, thank you. So the fearless, if the idea really came around, what are we afraid of? right? In our day to day. And I realize it's not necessarily about being fearless. So that's kind of the play on the words between fearless and fearless, because fear is always going to be there. The, The anxiety, the imposter syndrome, the, you know, myriad of thoughts that we bombard ourselves with are always going to be there. They're a part of us. But how can we allow ourselves to remain the driver in this car Everybody else, you know, gets to be in the car with us, but you're the one who's in control. And so it's about saying, okay, I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to do this thing afraid. I'm still going to allow myself to feel the feelings, but go forth anyway. Because I realized, you know, through my own personal life experiences that when we're in survival mode, when we haven't properly managed our stress, when we're just dealing, when we're in the thick of it, it's impossible to even begin to think about what are the outcomes of that you want to have in life? What are goals that you want to have in life? Because you're just getting through that day and then the next day and then the next day. And sometimes survival mode is necessary, right? For a certain season, because all you're capable of doing is just getting through it. But if we don't have those proper techniques in place, then we stay in that survival mode. And that leads to that chronic stress. And that leads to so many things around our mental health, emotional health, physical health. And so it's okay, I believe, to stay in seasons of survival mode if you have to, because that's what that's what's protecting you at that moment. But we can't stay there. And so it's about moving past that and recognizing those signs and getting really good measures in place to help manage the stress. So that way we do have the capability and the capacity to even step back, get off that hamster wheel and say, what pathway do I want to take in life? What do I actually want to do? And I experienced that several pivots in my life. Most recently, 2020 was a big pivotal one for myself. And I know a lot of people around the world. And it was one of those moments when my job position got eliminated. 
And I was sad for about five minutes because that was a little bit unexpected. But then I was excited because I knew I always wanted to do my own thing. And so I'm thinking, I get to do whatever I want. Crap, I get to do whatever I want. What do I want to do? And it's, we don't get enough opportunities to really sit back and say, what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to go? What pathway? What excites me? What invigorates me? And what lights me up? Because I really feel like, you know, we're put on this earth to to enjoy and to experience and to live. And I don't feel like it's just to like work and die. You know, we we live, I tell people all the time, we do live in this world where, you know, money is necessary. As much as I wish my mortgage company took well wishes and good vibes, they do not, Right. So in turn, I have to be paid in real money and people need real money to operate in life. But the whole idea is when I started to unpack this for myself, I realized, you know, so many people talk about the fear of failure and how I approach that is, I think it's kind of the cop out because everybody has failed at something. I think they try to mask the fear of failure when it's really the fear of success because the fear of success means I did it. Who do I have to be in this new iteration of myself? What rooms am I going to be in? What is my family and friends going to think? What does life look like now? And so to me, I think that big change, and I talk about this in my keynote, that the known is familiar. The known doesn't necessarily mean safe though, right? But we the the way the ego likes to work is it tries to say, you know, I want to keep you safe, I want to keep you protected. We know what's what this is right? Kind of that the devil you know. And truly, the unknown is what is more uncertain. But sometimes you have to go, as Elsa from Frozen would say, into the unknown. If anybody has kids, you know, under 10 years old here, they know. And, and so there's those times in my life, I call them forced growth and chosen growth. And sometimes there's a hybrid of the two. Forced growth is when things happen like job position elimination or like major life changes and major life pivots that you didn't necessarily plan on, but here you are, you're faced with it. And then the chosen growth is when you really get to create that space for opportunity and you get to create that space to choose what is that path you want to go. I think 2020 offered us both of those and a lot of, for a lot of people, you you were forced to choose, but you also were able to have that space to say, what do I want to do now? And a lot of people got to explore curiosities and choose new paths and get on things outside of, you know, this is the way it's always been. So I thought this is always how I have to do this. So it's a little bit about what the talk is. It's, it's a accumulation of my story, but then how do we really dissect the fear of success? And where is that story coming from? Because the fear of failure, I think people will just use that as a way to say, well, you know, I don't want to try. I don't want to fail. And it's like, I don't think you're afraid of the failure. I think you're afraid of the trying and the succeeding. Because that is the difference. That is when life changes and impacts. And, and I think about it on really big levels, but it can be on very small levels too, right? But change we think about is, is habit. And we know it takes 30 days to start a habit. And so when we're making huge life adjustments, we can't expect it to happen overnight. I personally got excited this morning because I made a promise to myself. I was like, you know what? This week, I'm starting this. I'm going to just do at least minimum 5K steps a day. I just wanted to make sure that I'm moving. And I got probably way too excited when my phone says, you have a new step trend alert for the past six days. And I was like, yes. This is me doing the thing. I said I was going to do it and then I did it. And then, you know, you get the outcome of it. So that's really what the talk is about because I think so many people resonate with that because whether it's huge, big dream, big goals, or whether it's small goals, you know, I think everybody can relate in that capacity of if I do it and commit to it and succeed, what what changes? How do I how do I show up differently in the world? And And showing up as a different iteration of yourself can be a scary thing because there are people in our life who have been with us all all the time and and they know that story. They know you as that person. And when all of a sudden things are different, it can be scary. So 
that's a little bit what it, what it's over and we dive into and it's fun. And I love seeing people's faces when they're like, yes, like the little light bulb moments when they're like that. I do realize that because the fear of success, I think, is a conversation that has happened, but I don't feel like it's happened enough to really resonate with people that that is what's potentially keeping them stuck from the doing. So many amazing nuggets in what you've shared. And I think We can take this a couple different ways. The first thing I think is that we have those seasons, right? I talk about seasons of doing and seasons of being, right? And I think to your point, there's definitely those different seasons, especially as you're, you know, managing through life. I want to talk and hear more of your thoughts around what is that mindset when we're changing from that, you know, fear of failure. And I like to talk about you know, failing fast and failing forward. But I really think what you've tapped into is that it is that fear of success. And I think it starts at a very young age. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, we both have tiny humans, but you know, the conversations that I have with those middle schoolers and high schoolers and then college students that I'm mentoring, they're all talking about the stress management component. They're all talking about fear of failure. They're all talking about, but, and, and I can't wait to kind of pivot them into this kind of Don't think about it as a fear of failure, but think about it as a fear of success. But let's talk about what is that mindset change that has to take place to help in that pivot and help in that relaunch. Yeah. And for me, the way that I personally experienced it was, you know, I think it goes back to, you know, childhood stories, the way that we experience life, the way that you know, you moved throughout when you were just young, especially like in your in your younger adolescence and then young adult years. And there, there's so much talk about, you know, what you have to do, what you're supposed to do, what should be the outcomes, what should happen. And when they don't happen, you know, that's when we get upset. And I think the mindset part of it is that we weren't properly equipped with how to deal with that when it didn't necessarily work out. Because there are times where we can, we can do the best, we can be the best, and yet we still do not achieve what we want in that capacity for some reason. And so then we get very frustrated and we go, well, you know, what was the point of all of that? When really, what did I learn from this? How can I grow from this? Like you said, failing forward in this to create this successful outcome that I want to have. And so I think it's being able to have that capacity to have that full self-awareness of being like, what exactly am I feeling? Why am I doing this? When I do the goal setting with people, I tell them, The goals that you want to achieve, one, are put on your heart for a reason. And two, what you're chasing isn't a physical outcome, essentially. It's an emotional outcome, right? How do you want to feel on the other side? When you imagine and embody yourself, this future version of yourself as having succeeded in what you're doing, that's an emotion that you're chasing, right? What is the, we'll use tangible things for it as an example, you know, what is that new house? What is that new car? How does that make you feel? You know, what are the bank account that you want to see? You know, the, you know, the whatever the outcome is like you're, it's an emotional attachment. And so I think that's what we have to realize. Like, what is that rooted in? Because I think people get stuck in the, well, once I have this, then I'll be happy. Once I have this, then it'll be better. Once this, and and, and to me, the real work is, I kind of contradict myself in that, but I'm like, find contentment in the now. So that way you can truly enjoy the journey because it's going to be more gratifying along the way when you say like, you know, I can't wait to have this particular outcome, but I'm happy right here, right now. And a a real life version, I think I, I even shared with you before and it made me cry in front of a group of strangers, which was very unexpected. But it was the idea, you know, we talked earlier about we're building onto an addition to our house. Right. And I was getting so caught up and they're like, oh my gosh, it's going to be so wonderful. We're going to have so much space. It's going to look like this. I can't wait for this. And then, and, you know, life's going to be just all peachy keen once all, once all that's done. And you start to look around the house that I, or I start to look around the house that I'm in now. And I'm like, oh, it's too small. It's too cluttered. It's too this, it's too that. And you start to really pick apart all the things that are not ideal in this scenario. And so when I caught myself doing that, I had to take that step back because I realized I'm not practicing what I'm preaching in this capacity because it is so easy to find all the flaws, all the things that are going to make you unhappy. And so my mind shift there was, 
you know, I made it the home that I wanted it to be and it served its purpose for now. And not only that, going, you know, a level deeper with our tiny humans, I was like, this is where my daughter learned to to crawl and to walk. These these walls hold memories. And it was it allowed me to take that step back to say and show gratitude for where I'm at right now, for the roof over my head right now. And that really helped me to just kind of calm down with the process and still be excited for the process, but in have it still rooted in some reality and be like, I'm content and happy with what I have now. I'm excited for the future, but I have to make sure that I can find enjoyment now and not wait until a year from now or who knows when now because things happen, right? Projects look different. Projects take longer than expected. And so if you constantly delay your happiness, delay your joy, then you miss out on so much of the now. And I think that's a big part of the mindset that is being missed along the way. And I think it ties beautifully into be present. Yeah. Because we have to hold in that moment and be present in that moment and have that gratitude for that moment. And what are we learning from that moment? And it could be, as you said, that forced growth or it's that chosen growth, but we need to be present and sit with those feelings or in that, in that season that we're in, because there's beauty and there's such a gift to be had in that be present moment. It really is. And that's why I love in, in my teachings and my workshops and my keynotes, having that undertone of mindfulness, Mm -hmm. because that's what it calls us to do. Mindfulness is paying attention on purpose and being fully present. But the key is without the judgment. To me, that's the hard part, right? The other part being I can be att- I can pay attention on purpose and be present, but then without judgment, that's where it gets to be difficult. And even though it sounds really simple, okay, great, I'm just going to pay, pay attention on purpose, I'm going to be present, simple doesn't always mean easy. And that's why I think it's a daily practice to do exactly what you said, to have one of you know, the pillars be, where can I be present? And mindfulness practice doesn't say like, (laughs) I'll back up for a minute because whenever I introduce mindfulness, people are always like, Rosa, I'm already doing the most, right? I'm trying to eat right. I'm trying to get enough sleep. I'm trying to like make sure that I see my friends and family. I'm trying to be good. And now you're telling me I have to add one more thing. And I was like, yes, but you are probably already doing elements of it. And it doesn't take a huge practice. It just says, where can we be additionally present? I use my cup of coffee as a mindfulness practice often because instead of just, you know, making it, pouring it and just like getting on with it, sometimes I'll be like, and it can just be that deep breath in and deep breath out and just sitting with it and enjoying it and the ritual around it. It can be your commute. It can be, you know, reading your story. It can be carving out just five minutes. It can be, you know, to be silly. It can be going to the bathroom without your phone, heaven forbid, right? And so there's so many ways that we can, include present moments and have that awareness. And we talked about, you know, you made that comment earlier, you know, slow down to speed up. And it's such a gift to have that self-awareness, but it's such a practice. I have found in my body that it is so acutely aware of when I'm not practicing it because I will literally start dropping things or tripping over things if I'm moving too quickly. And it's kind of like the universe is being like, slow down. I'm literally like making you drop things or fall over so you will slow down. And that's when I kind of get that cue and be like, that's true. Why, like, why am I even hurrying? There is not a purpose for this, but it's so ingrained in our society just to hurry, to be quick, to hurt. And I think that's, that's a little bit of the work is to, to have that present moment be aware and just say, how can I implement these little nuggets of mindfulness, little opportunities for mindfulness along the way? And I think what you are honing in on, and I think what's really important for our listeners to know is mindfulness doesn't have to be this, I'm going to a yoga class or I'm going to, it doesn't have to be this big arduous thing. It can be as simple as smelling your coffee or having that moment. So I'm going to ask you to walk us through like a one minute mindfulness. Okay. How about that? I love that. I love that. 
One of one of the ones that I love to do for people when when I bring up mindfulness, when I bring up meditation, it's you know, well, I don't like to sit still, and I'm like, good, don't. If that's if that's not what's what your body likes, don't do that now, right? Don't start off with that. And so for this one, just for the sake of people listening and things, I'll have people just first start off with from the belly, taking a big breath in through the nose, and then exhaling out the mouth, letting it go. And then just really tuning into that breath just for a moment. And then shift the awareness to the senses of hearing. I want you to reach for that sound that's furthest away. Life can be so full of distractions, but sometimes we can actually use them as anchors. And then shift your awareness to a sound closest to you. And then just back to the breath. Come back to the inhale. Back to the exhale. And then just allowing for that simple one minute, one moment of just inner peace, inner stillness. And you can open your eyes. And it really does have to be, it doesn't have to be, like you said, this full practice. It has to no. just be little touch points throughout the day that just bring you back to center. It helps oh. with decision making too, which is what yeah. I love. There's been so many things popping up for me throughout this year around stillness and quietness. Uh, I recently heard an, a very successful artist talk about he has five children at home and he's on tour all the time. And they were asking him, how does he get his inspiration for the next albums or the show? And he said, I sit in silence. And he said, because my life is so busy and my life is so loud. I need that stillness to be able to hear the next music, to be able to hear the next chords, to be able to hear that inspiration. And then I also heard another interview and they were talking about as you are healing, silence becomes more of a friend than it does scary. And, and so you're able to find that peace. And I think so many times as we are going through those different growths and those different growth seasons, we feel like we have to layer with noise or layer with, you know, layer with stuff. And as you continue to peel back and peel back, you start to actually feel a little bit more present and at home in the silence and the quiet. And that's actually a really good signal that you're healing. And I think that those, I think in this day and age, we are such a go society. And I think that I appreciate COVID for the catalyst that it brought to a lot of our lives to make us slow down, to cause us to realize, you know, what was it, what was truly important. But I think still we have so many strides and improvements to go on. It's okay to be silent. It's okay to be in the quiet. Exactly that. And I'm sure so many of your listeners can relate to the moments that you're laying down at bed at night. And that's when you start to get your best ideas, right? When you're trying to fall asleep or when you're in the car and you're on autopilot, when you're taking a shower and there is science behind that. And it's because you're not using your executive function. So your brain is having the opportunity to problem solve, not in an ideal time, but it's like, this is the only time that you have sit still. So we're going to do all the downloads. Now we're going to just problem solve, go through every single scenario. And so I teach people, I was like, you know, that happens to everybody. It's shared experience. What if we did it intentionally? Mm. What if we took that five to 10 minutes of meditative time to just sit and be and just allow the brain to go through the cycle of thoughts that it needs to go through in order to get to the outcome? Because that is another common misconception I find about meditation is, like I said before, people are like, I can't sit still. Then don't sit still. Don't sit for 30 minutes, cross legs, straight spine, straight. Like, 
that's, that is something to work up toward, right? You can do moving meditations. There are so many ways to do it. Start with five minutes, right? Because like you said, our society is so go, 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 go that stillness is uncomfortable for a lot of people. But really the body craves stillness because that's what helps get us out of our flight or flight. That's what helps reset the nervous system and it's going, okay, we are safe because we're allowed to be still. But it's a very scary thing because then people do, they have to sit with their own thoughts. And -hmm. sometimes your own thoughts, your own head can be a very scary place. So many people think being with the GST factor life, right, that we're getting shit done. We're, you know, and we got to go, 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 go. And that's one of those misconceptions and myth busters that I talk about a lot, too, is actually as much as you are doing that you have to be, you have to have Mm -hmm. that integration of those doing and those being seasons. And when you look at who is a GSD -er, they are actually people that are very present that have those meditations that have those quiet those still moments and i think that that's just something that can continue to cultivate and i think as more and more people do that i think we'll see more and more innovations come out and more positive change happening in the world because we're giving our minds and our bodies and our hearts and our energies that stillness that it craves and needs in order to be able to get shit done so I exactly. Absolutely, I absolutely love that. So and I don't I don't know about you, but I have found that anytime I go on vacation, I feel like that's when I get the most full inbox of like requests, opportunities. So part of me, I'm like, do I just stay on vacation for money? Or but it is one of the things like I like you said, energetically, I think it's like you realize that like your body is taking that time to rest, to have fun. Because yeah. as adults, we forget that we're allowed to have fun and enjoy things. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like the gates open and they're like, okay, great. She's in alignment now. She's feeling good. Like now here comes opportunity. So I would be curious to see if that is like, if you've experienced that. But I know lots of times when I'm on vacation, that's when my inbox, like it will literally be a ghost town, you know, for a couple of weeks leading up to it. And then I'll go on vacation and like, everybody's like, oh, I, we want to like reach out to you. And I'm like, cool. If you could do that before or after because now you have my out of office for um for my vacation (laughs) yes i find a lot of being an author and you know doing a lot of in the creative space when i need that creative space i will take that vacation but as soon as i do now the creative juices flow so you know on a recent vacation it was a driving vacation so you know i'm like sitting there just writing and my team are like where is all this coming from? And I said, because I'm on vacation and I have stillness and I have quiet and there's a quiet yeah. car. And um, yeah, I think it gives that capacity to so for more, that more, voca- more vacations are good for us. That's right. Agree. <laughs> all right. What is Rosa powerfully choosing in 2024? Oh my gosh. Yes. I have a lot of things that I've powerfully chosen, Um, maybe mixed with delusion, maybe mixed with (laughs) just audacity. Powerfully choosing in my personal life is that we are doing this home edition. And something possessed me in December when I was driving back from Florida. I had the stillness. I was by myself in, in, in my car. Again, we talk about get a lot of the best ideas. And I was like, what if we just chose chaos this year and not only tried to build our house, but also add on to our family. And so I I told my husband when I got back, I was like, so here's a thought. (laughs) And he was like, all right, let's do it. So powerfully choosing chaos this year and just leaning into that and having fun with it and saying, because I'm like, maybe then in 2025 and 26, things will be like, you know, a little calmer. But I say that in jest because who even knows what's going to happen then. But That's one thing that I'm powerfully choosing um, in my personal life. And then powerfully choosing in work is really putting this keynote out was a big deal. I got great inspiration talking with a friend who does similar work back in February when we were, we were just chatting, we were giving business advice, you know, what are you doing? How's things going for you? How's this? And she was asking me about my workshops and my offerings. And when we got on this specific, specific topic about stress and goal setting, she was like, I'm just going to put this out there, but you seem to really light up around this topic to help people move their lives forward in this capacity. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I really do enjoy that part. And so it was right out of that, like the idea for this high level keynote and how can I impact people? Because my whole goal 
is, you know, the workshop side of it is where we actually get to workshop and we get to like do all the fun stuff and write it down. But the keynote is to at least plant the seed and get them to think a little bit differently and have a shift from when they walked into the room and then when they walked out of the room. And to me, that is the part that really lights me up to get people inspired because I want people to really live just the, their, an authentic life, their best life, this life that they powerfully get to choose themselves instead of, you know, just living this monotonous, hamster wheel of a life where it's like, this is just what I do. I wake up and I do this and I have to, you know, any room we're going. And, and it's, and it's so easy to get on that wheel. I think we've all been on that wheel. I know personally throughout my life, I've always been on that wheel, but there's always been this inkling of like, there's something else. And it wasn't until I had the opportunity because of 2020 that I got to pull that thread a little bit more and it all kind of came unraveling in the best way that showed no, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it, it just, it feels different when you get to do that. And like I said, it can be, it can be big dreams. It can be little dreams. It can be just, you know, I want to start a crafting thing, you know, for a silly example, but just the, the courage to do so and the courage to sit, seek and think about what they want to do is what I've been able to powerfully choose in my professional life to kind of really go after and assert myself as that that's the platform that I want to preach on in uh, for lack of a better term. And so that's what really excites me and what I get to powerfully choose and, and tell people about. Well, Rosa, thank you so much. Some amazing nuggets. And I encourage all of our listeners to go back and re-listen and take notes because I think you've really helped with some of those mind shift changes. I think this will really resonate for a lot of our listeners. So thank you so much for sharing and thank you for putting this out into the world. We need more of this. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this conversation today with Rosa. And don't forget to get shit done. Thanks for listening to the GSD Factor podcast. If you liked this episode, please rate and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform where you can also find previous episodes. Let's also connect on LinkedIn and Instagram. If you're looking for more information on the GSD Factor, visit us at gsdfactor.com. And always remember to GSD, get shit done.